Kia ora tata, everybody. Bruce Arnold's my name, and I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit. Uh, tonight's webinar um, has been uh, supported by Tafoto Wara. So we're going to be uh, talking about efficient management of the inbox tonight. There's going to be four parts to, to tonight, and we've got three speakers uh, whom I'll introduce as we go on over the night. So first up tonight, we've got Daniel Calder. He's a GP uh, working at a VLCA practice in Flatbush. Uh, he's also the clinical director of East Health and uh, the uh, Your Health Summary and Health Improvement Group. So Daniel, uh, over to you to start off the evening. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, Kira Koto, Ko, Daniel Calder, Toko Ingra. Um, I am delighted to be invited to talk on this topic. Um, I have um, increasingly become concerned about what we call uh, that massive deluge of uh, inbox items that I think many of you on um, the call tonight will be familiar with as well. Um, so we've, we've called it surviving the digital deluge. I, I think that um, if you look back over the years, things have got increasingly worse in terms of the volume. But tonight, what I'm hoping to do is to instill a little bit of hope and maybe just share um, where I see uh, some of the future uh, directions. So we're not quite out of the uh, dark tunnel yet, but there is light at the end of it. Now, you'll be familiar with some of these different sources of documents. Uh, we've got public, we've got private, we've got pretty much every specialist um, copying us into things. Some of the um, document streams are absolutely necessary and is interesting and we want to get those document streams. Others, uh, you'd have to argue, is probably more noise and it risks um, people not having sufficient time actually to look at the important things in their inbox. Uh, what I've found, particularly in, I suppose, my PHO role uh, in East Health, is that in conversations with Tafat Aura, it's quite easy to look at uh, setting up new uh, document flows. So everyone is very keen to push new types of information through to GP, uh, but extremely challenging to switch things off. Um, and I think that's what you've seen the results of. The, just uh, over the years, you're getting an increasing loading in terms of different items. Now, Apart from the quantity going up, uh, I think it's fair to say that the complexity is increasing. That's not uh, unique to primary care, but I think we are very much at the sharp end of that. So as hospitals are under strain, uh, there is an expectation that we can and should do more. And uh, you're having to read through all these uh, documents with a fine tooth comb, making sure that you're not missing anything. And of course, people are increasingly concerned around issues like vicarious liability. Once you've seen something, then there is that obligation to also uh, act on that. Now, the expectations um, in terms of what we do with inbox items comes from a range of uh, sources. Sometimes it's the sender, and sometimes it's our patients, but also I think um, as uh, primary care providers, we um, have quite high expectations of ourselves. Um, sadly, um, a lot of uh, time goes into manual re-entry of data. So quite a classic will be that you're getting an inbox document, uh, perhaps in the shape of a PDF, um, and you're then having to input data from, from that, which is time consuming. One of the things I want to talk about this evening, and really the main uh, topic for my part of this presentation, is around what we call automation bots. Now, you might have heard about bots and you might not have. Bot is just short for robot. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, that Dr. Jamie Shepard is uh, probably the first one that I know of, at least in New Zealand, who um, introduced automation bots in primary care. Um, and I have uh, been very inspired by what he's done. And we're trying to do something similar uh, in East Health. So I'll talk a bit more about automation in a moment. But apart from that, we also need to reduce the volume of documents coming through. Um, and that's, um, I think, something that everyone that has a clinical leadership role uh, has some responsibility trying to work at that. Um, because otherwise, even with automation, we will still be struggling to cope with the volumes. 
Um, and I have also just put in here utilizing extended care teams. So I know that there are colleagues that have done lots of exciting work around uh, getting more um, clinical team members and sometimes non-clinical staff to be involved in handling documents. And that can range from having um, a medical center assistant or um, other forms of um, unregistered workforce that you train up and work within protocols, all the way up to having a clinical pharmacist that can do med rec. But it is automation that I'll mainly cover now. So it is important to recognize that automation is different from artificial intelligence. Automation is very repetitive. It follows rules. Uh, and it's not, uh, some of you might have played around with chat GPT or other AI tools. Uh, automation is much more like a email forwarding rule. So if you're going on leave uh, and you're asking Outlook to forward all emails to another particular person or perhaps an auto reply. Um, so it really follows strict rules rather than trying to um, do something particularly clever. But um, it's the number of steps uh, that makes it a bit different from an email forwarding rule. Um, we'll mention just in terms of AI or artificial intelligence, um, because I, I do think that there is a role for that in modern medicine as well. It's a bit more complex uh, and there's a lot more learning involved rather than just setting up uh, strict rules. So um, I think that we will see a lot more artificial intelligence and that it'll happen sooner than what we might have thought. Um, but automation is something that is available um, here and now, and um, it's pretty exciting. So this is just an overview of one of the automation bots that we uh, deploy in East Health, and it's a simplified workflow diagram. Don't expect to, to sort of look at every element here, but I just wanted to show that there are quite a few uh, steps in the process. And it's almost like different gateways that the bot works through, um, and then you get different outcomes depending on what it finds. Now, I will um, share a very short video. It's just um, over a minute, and it actually takes you through uh, the sequence for one of the bots. I thought it would be interesting for people just to have a look at that. So we'll see. This is how the bot starts. It actually logs in. It's got its own uh, login. It goes into the relevant clinic, um, and this is just a landing page. We've not um, sped this up, so this is the actual time that it takes. Um, and it's important to have some delays at certain steps um, to allow the PMS to catch up. So these are all mock patients that we're seeing here. Um, it will search for a screening fit test. So that's the bowel screening. And it's selected all inboxes. So it's all providers in that clinic. And then it's just searching through. Um, and once it's found all the screening tests, it will go to the first one. Uh, and it's looking for specific terms that we've selected and it's identified that it is a fit test. It will now select the relevant provider. So this is one of my um, colleagues in the practice. And it's um, saying that's a bowel screening program. So in Indice, this is a screening term in MedTech. Um, no, sorry, in, in Indice, it's measurement. In, in MedTech, it would be a screening term. And then it sets the recall depending on uh, the time that was in the document. And it'll go back to the document, then put in the text that we predefined, and it'll file that, and it'll move on to the next. I think that there are a phenomenal amount of different types of bots that we could set up. These are some of the ones that we've currently developed from East Health. Um, you can see we're focused on screening results. I think it saves times, uh, a lot of time both for our GPs and for our nurses. Um, we're thinking of quite a few different exciting things that we can develop next, um, ranging from doing cardiovascular risk assessment, that would be the virtual ones for that, uh, to filing some of those status updates that we think you probably don't always need to see. Um, so we will uh, develop quite a few more bots. I think it's uh, important to prioritize the ones that will give the biggest uh, impact in terms of time saving. Um, but I think there'll be some nice ones, even trying to fall through all the inboxes, looking at results that haven't been actioned within a set time frame. So that could be a safety feature. 
Um, in terms of how we make this safe, so there's a lot of planning that goes into this before you launch a bot, really thinking through all the steps. We also do quite a lot of testing, uh, and you can run the bot uh, in testing mode without doing any filing. Um, and that's just a nice way of checking that it uh, behaves in the way that you would expect. Every single step is audited, so you can go back and see what the bot has done and undo if there was any issues. But I have to say the bots are really reliable, they're consistent, they don't get tired, um, and it's really predictable. So when there's a new class of document or different wording, it will just stop, it won't uh, action that document, and it can move on to the next, and it'll just sit in the inbox for human intervention. Um, I have had questions around what if something goes wrong, who would you blame, how does that work? So I think it comes back to having really good um, clinical governance and oversight of the whole process, being thorough before we launch, uh, and then continuing to have good monitoring and audit. Um, as with any system, you do need to um, resolve issues if they should arise. Um, I know there's a lot of interest amongst clinicians now around uh, liability and particularly around things like vicarious liability. I think particularly when it comes to a system like this, um, it's more around what construct you have within the clinic. So if it's a um, limited company, it is actually the company that is responsible for everyone that's employed in the clinic. And same, you are responsible for the systems that you use. Um, and it would be a bit different if it was uh, sole partnership or uh, multiple partners. But ultimately, um, it's not that different from having um, a human employee. You, you are responsible for the systems that you put in place. Having said that, um, I've not had any issues with the bots. Um, they just haven't done unexpected things, unlike sometimes humans. Um, so I've, I've mainly talked about um, automation, but just in terms of AI, I think there is a lot happening. And some of you might be aware of uh, exciting dictation tools. Um, that's not part of um, my session this evening, but I think you can expect to see uh, some pretty cool stuff coming out soon and some available already now. I think artificial intelligence can also be used for some of the admin processes, uh, particularly finding appointments, those sort of things and also improving on safety through better integration within the PMS. Uh, I've also had questions around the cost. Um, it's really difficult to put a specific dollar value. There is software out there that um, is free, uh, but you can also pay licensed versions. The real cost in this to me is actually around the time spent. So you need a combination of IT expertise and clinical expertise. Uh, and it's quite time consuming to develop the bots. So that's where the real cost sits, uh, I would say. Um, I think there is a huge role here for PHOs to support clinics. And certainly from East Health, that is um, one of our priorities now. We think that um, it's similar in terms of priority as a data warehouse. It's really uh, one of the ways that we can support clinics. And I, I would encourage you if, if you, uh, think that automation might be something you're interested in, have a chat with your PHO, uh, because it does help to have a bit of scale uh, when you develop these tools. So, Daniel, we've got a few questions there. Um, may, the main one is, are the bots available uh, only on industry? What about med tech evolution in my practice? Yeah, yeah. So, look, I've um, been involved in developing these bots with the support of uh, very good IT folk. Um, and we've tested out an industry because that happens to be what I use in a clinic that I work. Um, East Health is moving on with MedTech Evolution next uh, because we do have quite a number of clinics on that. Um, there is nothing stopping uh, this sort of tool to be deployed in other PMSs. It really depends on having that scale. So that's why I would suggest uh, rather than each clinic trying to develop their own tool um, to have a conversation with your respective uh, PHOs to see whether they would consider doing this. Um, uh, what program do you use to set 
up your box? Is it relatively easy to set up if you're okay with IT stuff from Torrance? The program that we use is called UiPath. Um, it is not uh, that straightforward. Um, so I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable doing the IT side of it myself. I get good support with that and I'm more doing the clinical governance. Uh, I think if you are reasonably IT savvy, then you probably can. Um, but it comes down to how much time you've got available to spend on this. And I guess if you're trying to uh, save time around admin, uh, it might be better to scale it up rather than um, doing a lot of the development yourself. A question from Graham here. Is the software basically recorded screen macros? Yes, uh, to a large extent. Uh, but there are it's not all screen macros because it's also reading text and interpreting based on that and it's rules based. So it's not because a straight macro would just click 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 um, in a sequence without having any um, ability to act on different types of results. So it's picking out specifics from the documents as well. There was an interesting presentation at the uh, college conference from the Wellington Medical Group about, uh, and they looked at the time and motion and time saved. And one of the big time killers is the letters from the hospital with something embedded in it that you had to pick out and then do a recall or arrange for an ultrasound or something. And they found that was the place where they saved most of the time by having a, a, a human clinical assistant, which was interesting. They didn't find much time was saved on just filing normal results, which is, I guess, what most of us sort of think. So do you have a view on that? Or and I guess the second yeah. question would be, should the hospital's um, secondary care have a much more structured letter to GP so the, 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 the must-do stuff is at the top, which it isn't always, I have to say. It's uh, absolutely beneficial to have a good structure. And um, when, when you get that box at the top, with the specific actions that you're expected to do or key points for the primary care clinician, that's really helpful in the same way when they pull things out that is for the patient. Uh, that's particularly useful for the human eye. So I think that's uh, essential to work with hospital colleagues in terms of how they design the letters. Um, automation will probably not replace uh, the human eye for things like a letter that sets out a quite complex set of instructions. So the way I see it is that automation can handle a lot of the more straightforward routine documents that come in, and then you could focus and spend more time on the complex documents. Uh, can the bots update medications from hospital discharge summaries? Not the type of bots that we've developed. Um, I think that is pretty challenging. I'm not going to say that it can't be done, but I think that um, that's where in, in the clinic that I'm working uh, myself, we've got a clinical pharmacist, and that's been a real game changer. So I would probably not see bots as being the solution there, not for the near to medium future, at least. Yeah. What What's going to be the fail-safe option? How do you know your bot is doing it right? So when, when we uh, introduce uh, a bot to a new clinic, so the first thing we'll do is have uh, an in-depth conversation with a clinic to understand how they currently uh, treat different documents, and then uh, make sure that the bot is configured in a way that fits with that. Um, then we do dummy runs. So it's um, it's real results, but it's not filing, it's not setting recalls. The bot is just creating a document where it says what it would have done. Um, when the clinical team is happy that this fits with what they would usually do and what they expect, um, then we will put it into live mode, it'll action things, um, and then you can go back and you can audit and see whether there was anything unexpected. And like I said, we, ha we haven't had any surprises. There's also other steps that we can put in that we haven't done yet, but we're about to launch, which would be getting the bot to communicate with the patient. So if you've got a normal cervical smear result, um, we can automa automate sending a standard um, text message or email to, to that person as well. So how much time saving can you uh, get with a bot in a new clinic? So we haven't quantified yet uh, how much time saving with existing bots, but I, I think that it really comes to how many bots you've got running concurrently, because if we can automate 
um, all of the screening plus a lot of the routine messaging um, across a big group. So we've got about 20 GP colleagues and about you know, the same number of nurses. Um, there's considerable hours that I think we can save per week in, in admin. Uh, but we haven't quantified the exact number. Is the Wellington Clinical Group, their clinical assistant, actually went through and did a time and motion thing, which is quite interesting. I think they could save about two hours a week per full time GP, which mm. uh, which is quite uh, it was quite an elegant presentation. Those of you who saw it. So our, our next topic is is a, a cameo performance with uh, uh, Luke Look. Uh, he's trained in both urgent care and primary care. Works for Tafotuwara, County's Manukau, uh, and he's just going to talk briefly about um, uh, GP liaison. So over to you, Luke. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Luke. I'm one of the primary care clinical advisors from County's Manukau. My background is urgent care and GP, and I'm still working currently um, there as well, in addition to my employment by Tafotuwara. Today, I want to introduce the primary care clinician team in the first half of my presentation. And then the second half, I'm going to talk about what we can do to help with the inbox situation. So our primary care clinician team consists of um, general practitioner, nurse practitioner, registered nurse, and pharmacist. Many of us, like myself, have um, part-time roles with Tifa Teora and also actively working in primary care. Working across both primary care and secondary care offers us unique insight into opportunities to improve equity and clinical outcomes. We provide a unique skill set that resulted in the development of a wide range of roles across the northern region with strong patient and final focus. Our clinical knowledge, expertise, and leadership support improvement, service development, and innovation quality assurance. Over the years, our roles have grown and resulting in a well-functioning network spinning across multiple teams that has consistently responded to the new areas of need. This was demonstrated during the recent pandemic as the team applied our problem-solving, system thinking, and solution-focused abilities to support the Lofton region response. We are actively sitting in the clinical governance and steering group within national level, Northern Region and Mitchell Auckland. We also wish into area like public health, system improvement and data and digital. In addition, we also contribute at all levels covering strategic, operational and clinical governance. As mentioned, we interact with multiple teams across the entire health system. Our roles have six main functions. Firstly, clinical leadership. This function focuses on the clinical quality and safety of a service or program. It encompasses clinical guidelines and policy development. For example, support for standing orders and review complex cases and complaints. Secondly, we provide primary care focused clinical advice at executive, divisional, and service levels. This applies to primary care providers, secondary clinicians, managers, and PHOs with specific emphasis on equity, best practice, and consumer-focused care. Thirdly, we develop communication and educational channels. This include maintenance messengers, ed educational symposium, and webinar night to night. Next, we have system-wide networking, engagement, and interface functions. In this function, we socialize between so clinical services and pathway within the district and region. We work towards improving intervention as well as mutual understanding and cooperation. Our aim is to build and maintain strong relationship with different parties. This include primary care organization, secondary care specialties and community representative. Second to last, system improvement and innovation. We continue to work on different projects to provide quality improvement. Example would be access to diagnostic project that allow primary care to request X-ray, ultrasounds, MRI, and CT scan. This means that a greater number of the patients can be managed in the community closer to their home. Finally, we provide quality assurance by assisting the adverse event 
with investigation. This include managing feedback and complaint from both primary care and secondary care. We receive, investigate, communicate, and implementing local changes per industry system change as well. Let me share some of our operational rules with you and give you some more specific example. They are main focus on acute demand and plan the care to support primary care, hospital, and specialist services. Number one, we are the liaison team to support team integration. Number two, we are point of contact for clinical questions and provide support for committee referrals. Number three, we provide primary care expertise to support operational projects and initiatives. Number four, we charge prioritize primary and secondary care referrals. Number five, we develop M1 education sessions. And number six, we oversight and support GPs with special interests. So now moving on to the second half of my presentation, it's gonna be more interesting. I'm gonna give you a real example of what we have done. I want to share a case that primary care clinicians have managed that was um, impacting on the inbox. Several GP from the community sent us feedback about receiving a letter from the retinal screening service. Primary care clinician representative in the primary care um, health information committee meeting identified that a PVC letter was generated by the retinal screening technician following the screening session. There are a total of two letters sent after one visit. The first letter was after the patient was seen by the technician, and the second letter was sent after the consultant have graded the screening images. It's clear to us that the consultant grading letter is more meaningful as it informed the primary care the result from screening and the management plan for the patient. It was ascertained that no one in the hospital read the first letter and stopping it would not cause any issues. Therefore, the decision was made. We stopped the first letter. This resulted in one less document going into the inbox. In this case, the primary care clinician was able to manage feedback from primary care, improve the system, and by interact with the white network. So how to primary care feedback to us? In Kanti's Manical, we got the feedback central. Like many primary care clinics, we have system and procedure in place for compliments, suggestions, inquiries, and complaints. Feel free to give us some compliments if there are any good service that you receive. If there are anything for improvements, suggestions are welcome. Something you're not sure about, you can send us an inquiry. Finally, complaint will be investigated when they are unsatisfactory or unacceptable experience. We will review the individual case to see what happened, then involve the appropriate clinical quality risk managers, service managers, or clinical directors to look for resolution. We believe with no feedbacks, you will keep doing the same thing again, the same, the same way. That means you repeat the same mistake again, again, and again with no improvements. So go into help pathways. Search for hospital feedback and communication. Feedback central email, phone number, and an online form will be there. As primary care clinicians, I like the clinician for the primary and secondary healthcare system. We are there to look at presenting complaints. Then we look at history, examine, investigate, and try to formulate a plan, a management plan for different issues. However, as we all know, sometimes there are chronic issues that we can't fix quickly. Like the patient with experience of over 100, we need to be patient. So we can't promise we can fix everything, but we are here to listen to your ideas, concerns, and expectations. Furthermore, we also provide feedback from secondary care to primary care. Like the biliary HSA case we presented last month, when we heard about that, we contacted the GP to provide support and discuss about the case. When you get a call from us, don't be alarmed. We are here to give constructive feedback so we can enhance the patient and final care together. I don't know everything either, but between me and you, we can provide courageous support to each other.
Finally, on behalf of all the patients that have been looking after primary care, we want to say thank you. We appreciate you for all the work that you have done in primary care. Our healthcare system are facing intense strain. Effective, co effective cooperation between primary and secondary care are important to provide patient-centered care. We are conducting this impulse survey to hear your voice so we can tackle this situation together. No one should be spending the night looking at the inbox. There are things that our moms, friends, and the society think that we should be doing instead. Thank you for your time, and I will hang over back to um good friend now. Thank you. Uh, Luke, we've got one question there. Is there a feedback system for Auckland and Waitamata? There is a very good question. Um, I believe that we do have GPDs on there. Um, their feedback system is a bit different from us. Um we do have interaction between Auckland and Waitamata as well. But if you search again hospital and um um feedback in the um, help pathway, there are contact details for them there. But the more feedback we have from you guys, the more um, issue we hear from you guys, so we can pay some attention to it and see what we can do about that. So we will um, uh, move on to uh, Dr. Albert Wu. Uh, he's a medical administrator and registrar. He's a trained GP 2022 and a first year trainee for RACMA. Um, and he's going to cover some more stuff on Inbox. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for spending your time. Um, so let's talk about how we survived the digital deluge. Um, yeah, and got my fellowship last year and essentially have moved towards a non-clinical role um, because I do have a passion in terms of trying to um, make change. And I feel like this is a good opportunity in this role currently this year at County's Manico. So I've been working on quite a few different primary care projects, um, and this is one of them. So uh, a few people have alluded in the chat in terms of why do we get things that's coming to inbox that's clearly not my patient, because um, under the practice, um, most practices do have a patient um, associated with a particular GP in the practice, um, and I'll explain why. Um, the patient administration system in the hospital, so we'll think of this as the local record, um, essentially it contains all patient demographic details, non-medical related. And you can think of this as a central database where pretty much all the applications in the hospital um, that runs, that bring that pulls information from this particular central system. Uh, in counties and Waitamata, we actually use the same one. Uh, it's called IPM. Uh, Auckland and uh, Northland have different ones as well. The National Enrollment Service, which most of our colleagues here will be probably quite familiar, essentially is a live national database in terms of what the patients are enrolled with in terms of which primary care. Now, this is essentially can be treated as a source of truth, given that this is very much related to capitation, we can see that we can say that primary care definitely uh, has a good interest in terms of keeping this uh, up to date. Now, we know that obviously um, it would be nice if they actually talk to each other, but in reality, they do not. And essentially what would happen um, is, uh, what's happening currently is when patients arrive to hospital, based on the criteria and whatnot, um, they, the usual clerical workflow is that they ask patients who your GP is, or they will just confirm whatever is on the system, what's on the left side, which is the local system. Now, because it doesn't talk to the national enrollment system and data is not pulled directly from the national enrollment system, that means whatever the patient says, who is your um, their doctor, um, the clerical staff manually inputs onto the pass. And if you're unfortunately a very popular doctor in a particular practice, they may just pick you by name because that is the difficult, um, well, from being, I guess, if you're popular, that's the problem. Um, so that obviously causes the problem because everything that's on the PASS system and basically clinical letters, discharge summaries, blood tests, x-rays, everything, um, it gets sent to that particular practice and that particular GP as well. And that's basically the problem. So what's happening at the moment is if you do get misdirected mail um, that is not from your practice, then the expectation is that you would send these mail back to the clinical records department and what the clinical records department would essentially correct on their local patient administration system 
what is the provider that's on the national enrollment system. And then they would resend this correct letters, discharge summaries, uh, radiology results to the one that's listed on the national enrollment system. And this is a, essentially a workflow problem where um, the ability to view what's on the national enrollment system is only recent um, in the past few years. And it's a lot of the clerical staff is still stuck in the previous workflow where they're not um, checking the NES and they're just updating based on what the patient says. So that's something that we're trying to fix. Um, in terms of looking at how much burden is for the hospital, you can see that um, just basing on the four districts in the Northern region, in terms of misdirected mail per day, in terms of Northland, 10 per day, and they spend about one hour a day trying to fix it. And Waitamata, they were used to getting 25 to 30 per day before they started using NES, and now currently it's 9 to 13 misdirected mails per day, and it takes about uh, a shorter time frame, about one hour for them to fix. Uh, Auckland is the one that's a bit tricky because they get quite a lot, and they do take a lot more hours to fix. Uh, and that's also partly because of the limited information they can see from the NEST database. Um, their system only allows them to look at the practice, but not the provider. So best they can see from the glimpse of NEST is just the practice provider. Uh, whereas at Waitamata and counties, we can see not just the provider, and we can see who, uh, so not just the practice, but we can see that who the provider is as well. Um, I'll show you uh, in a bit. So currently what's happening at the moment is I've rewrited the training modules and we're creating new training modules for every clerical staff at counties to standardize the workflow in terms of essentially from here onwards, you don't need to ask the patient, well, basically what I'm trying to get them to do is not ask the patient who their GP is. And we're basing it entirely on what is on the national enrollment system. So that way uh, it is very clear and it is primary care's responsibility to update NES. Um, and then that way, like it will just be sent to the right person. And currently I'm in the process of retraining all the clinical uh, and the clerical staff at counties. Um, I'm halfway through, but you know, still taking a while as well. And then there is audit to make sure that the education is uh, correct and they are going to do this thing properly. Um, this is just a screenshot in terms of what we can see in counties of Waitamata. On the left side, you can see that this is our local records. And on the right side, you can see that this is the national record. And you can see very clearly in terms of the organization, you can see some uh, in terms of the status, in terms of if it's active, that means this patient has seen GP, the primary care in the last three years. Um, and the problem, as you can see over here on the box on the right, it says actually there's no provider that's been assigned. Now, in the national enrollment system, it does not force each primary care to actually fill in this provider part. So certain um, PHOs, uh, in terms of their business model, they le usually leave it as blank as well. Um, and essentially, that is a slight problem. So what would actually happen is in this scenario, if, if it's left as blank, then what we have to do at counties is we just have to randomly pick a clinician from the list that's associated with this particular practice. Um, so the instructions is to make sure not to pick the first one because it's based on um, alphabetical order. Um, but that's the problem. So I guess in terms of long-term wise, there is a consideration in terms of what to do um, and what needs to be done um, for clinics. But most primary care practices do have a provider uh, on the national enrollment system. So it is important if you can provide that because it would help secondary care direct everything towards to the right um, right GP and nurse practitioners, urgent care, well, not urgent care providers in this set, in the city. Um, after this, the next step is to present to the Northern region and make sure that they also follow suit in terms of understanding the importance of actually making sure everything on their local system matches the national enrollment system. But there's a big issue of underreporting, and I'm almost certain that there is just, there's probably a lot more misdirected mail. And I guess I am asking all our primary care colleagues to let us know. When this happens, send it through. It, it is going to take more time, and I do, I do apologize. Um, but just like Luke said, the more feedback that comes through, the more it's going to come up on the radar. So that is, this is what we're asking of all of you. Um, in terms of dilemmas to CC the GP, um, my God, this I hate this phrase, um, but it is a pretty scary phrase. But essentially, according to the Medical Protection Society and the Health and Disability Commissioner, um, 
there is a secondary responsibility for primary care to act on significant abnormal results. And the important part here is significant abnormal results. Um, and essentially, regardless whoever ordered in the first place, um, it is there is a responsibility. And how much you're responsible is dependent on that specific clinical situation. So things with potential serious disease or previously unrecorded diagnosis such as cancer, um, you are expected to act in a timely manner. Even though you are not known in terms of what's happening to the original requesting clinician, what they have done, what they what they plan to do, um, and that is very tricky. And for things that are low clinical importance and where the patient is receiving ongoing care from the requester, such as if they are inpatients, then it is unlikely that you would be criticized for not acting on a result. So the trick over here is actually you have to use your clinical judgment in each instance. And there is no clear way to, it is very tricky. Uh, it is a gray area. And I have sort, and, and this is sort of from, um, uh, statements from the MPS and also the HCC as well. So uh, that's why I guess the solution is whether or not we should receive them in the first place. Um, in terms of understanding the dilemmas, so for an example, if a patient was recently diagnosed with breast cancer, and then you receive an MRI brain scan um, in your inbox, um, if we want to put a time to it, Friday afternoon, Friday, late Friday, when you're still filing your inboxes after everybody's long gone, um, hopefully that doesn't sound too familiar or triggering to people, um, and the brain scan doesn't show good news. So what are you supposed to do about it? If you file it, then if your practice has online portals, then the patient can actually see it. And because if you assume that, well, somebody else is going to follow up on that because I didn't order the scan. But if the patient can see this result online, then without having any proper consultation, this can cause distress to them as well. So that's probably not the best solution. If we're not filing it, then what's the plan? So we are wanting to make sure that we are chasing what's happening in the hospital but the problem is like it's not very clear because we can't really see what the hospital has decided to plan the best that we can see at least in the northern region because we do have test safe um we can see who has seen um the uh, we can see if they've seen the report but that's seeing the report is not the same as understanding what they've actually planned or decided to do as well so and the problem is like are we just waiting for the next clinic letter? Are we waiting for the next MDT letter to come through? That's going to take weeks. Are we just going to leave this um, brain scan report in our inbox for weeks while we're just clogging things up? So that doesn't seem like a easy, uh, viable option. Are we going to bring the patient info consult? Um, when is the patient available? Do you have availability in your clinic these days? And um, are they going to be able to make the time? Is it going to cost? Can they have the... Um, financial ability to come see you to discuss this brain scan. I mean, the more important question above this is also like, do we actually, is it within our scope of practice to really talk this through in terms of uh, discussing um, the best solutions or what the patient expectations are? So that's also a problem, isn't it? Um, are we writing a letter to the hospital? We, uh, we're going to spend time to write an e referral to hospital that says, hey, this is the report that I received. Um, please, it's abnormal. Uh, can you make sure that the patient is seen as early as possible? And then the question is, if you send this off, the hospital will look at us, go, okay, we know the result, um, decline it. And then the patient gets a letter in their mail saying that you've been declined um, for this particular service. So that's also confusing. Um, or if you write the letter to the hospital, then it's also essentially visible on the patient's portal as well. So that doesn't seem like a good solution. Should we call the clinician who ordered the MRI scan? Uh, good luck on that one. So I'm just going to move on. So essentially what this is creating is an extremely inefficient health system. And essentially it is creating that vicarious liability to primary care as per the previous discussions as well. So you can see that this is definitely an issue. Um, and well, TestSafe is essentially there for the past many years for those in the Northern region. For those outside the Northern region, it is essentially a portal that allows us to see everything that's happened in the hospital with regards to the clinic letters, the discharge letters, the blood tests, scan results, histology results, and also including the, um, the pharmacy dispensing medications as well. So it is a system that is available for those primary care providers in Northern region. 
Um, so if we do in the end stop these things coming through uh, in our inbox, it doesn't mean that we've taken away that ability um, from primary care to actually see what is going on as well. So um, I guess to segue in terms of, so there's actually a district health board, um, Canterbury has actually successfully um, stopped all CCs um, to their primary care inbox. And they've done that since 2019. Um, and essentially on the Canterbury health pathways, um, there is a part where there's a document that outlines the principles and practicalities of transfer of care between secondary and primary care in the Canterbury health system. It's a very fun six page read. Um, but it's good. It outlines exactly what sort of things they have reached an agreement with the hospital not to send or things to send. And if they are wanting to CCGP, there is a expectation to call primary care to have a handover. Um, essentially, uh, primary care providers are specialists in the community and um, basically, yeah, so it is a professional obligation or just nicety, I guess. So essentially what's going on with the Northern region and what about the rest of Aotearoa? Like, can we just follow suit with Canterbury? Um, in the Northern region, certainly it's definitely a possibility given that we have something similar system and we have test safe. Uh, it might not be possible in other parts of New Zealand if there's not that easy visibility in terms of what's going on with their um, with the hospital blood tests or the radiology investigation. So it is, different here and there. But essentially what I'm currently working on is I'm doing another, the survey that's been uh, advertised on Facebook. It's probably going through a few different, um, going through a few different PHR newsletters. Um, and essentially what this project I'm trying to do is I'm wanting to understand the landscape of electronic inbox management in the Northern region. And in terms of all the people that I'm trying to sample, um, anybody who is clinically active, primary care providers, GPs, urgent care physicians, nurse practitioners, anybody who is actively managing an inbox, you're very welcome. This does include registrars as well. Um, so um, you are all included. Um, data collection wise, so things I will be asking is actually understanding the medical legal awareness and then I will be transi transitioning to things that's in the inbox and also the suggested solutions and wanting you to rank some of the suggested solutions as well that I've that we've come up. Um, and I will also be asking about things like patient facing and also non-patient facing clinical hours in terms of trying to analyze um, what's it like for us and how many hours we're actually spending. Um, the difficult, uh, the reason why I'm doing this is that we can get a baseline Plus also the fact that the previous college um, surveys, they usually, <clears throat> the data that is presented is most likely an average, but that's not very helpful because everybody has varying work hours. So I'm wanting to find that ratio between patient facing and non-patient facing, which is essentially when you're seeing patients and when you're doing paperwork, anything paperwork related. So that's what I'm hoping to achieve and we can have a better grasp and idea what's going on in Northern region. Time frame one to two months. Uh, it's been almost two weeks. I've had about almost 200 responses. Um, let's keep up the good work. Outcome wise, I, after this is completed based on the survey results, if it's worth um, submitting to Northern Region to file to for a change, then I will do it. Um, but I also do want to do this as a research publication as well. Um, because it's, I guess it's never been published before. And I think it's important to actually have it somewhere um, and uh, very clear in terms of documenting our preferences. A special mention to the Auckland Health Research Ethics Committee. Um, gosh, it was one of the most difficult times of my life getting ethics approval, but I'm glad it is over. Um, and then I've had a lot of support from the Northern Region Clinical Governance Forum and GPNZ, College of GP, College of Urgent Care, Nurse Practitioner New Zealand and Medicines as well. So you might get more um, primary care communications through them in the next couple of weeks. Um, but the strongest support that I do require is from all of you. Your opinion does matter. There is a link. We're going to put the link into the group chat. Um, uh, I think maybe including my contact details, but that's also inside the link as well. If you're in the Northern region, please 
if you're uh, outside the northern region if you know anybody in northern region that is fine um if you can reach out to them that'll be great if you wish to copy my results um and make it applicable to your region just reach out that is absolutely fine um open to questions okay um albert we're running short of time but um a lot of support for the, the canterbury model stop the cc um is coming through loud and clear and Alan Moffat thinks you're probably undercounting the misdirected letters. He says he gets six per week and he only does one day per week in practice. So I think we we just try and deal with them ourselves. I don't think we alert the DHB. So it's uh, I don't know how easy it would be to stop the to do the Canterbury thing. How easy would it be to do that? Ah, uh, okay. Um just we, briefly, we've only got us uh, briefly. We're, we're uh, out of lots time. Of, really lots lots of relationship building, lots of getting people individually in meeting rooms to explain to them what it is. Um, definitely very dangerous to actually just go into a big meeting and just tell them about the plan and the request. So I think it's going to be a lot of work in the background. But look, we need the data and I need your help, basically. So things, we feedback back to Luke um, doing the survey for me is all kind of moving towards the goal. We need more data so we can actually drive change. Okay, so we're just going to move on, coming back to Luke. So thank you, Albert. Uh, Luke's going to talk about uh, clinical updates for 10 minutes. Yeah, so uh, at the end of the webinar, we just wanted to give some updates. Um, and there are three updates um, tonight that we want to give. Um, over the last two weeks, um, Public Health Service have received a two notification of invasive medical Menstrual cocoa disease from two separate households and potential notification from another household. National, nationally, there have been three infant deaths in 2023 from pertussis. So it's important that we look out for it. Information on signs, symptoms, and testing can be found on health pathway. Number two, um, between April, June 2023, there has been a concerning increase in acute rheumatic fever cases, notifying of um, the regional public health system. Um, please ensure that access to social management for those high risk for rheumatic fever are um, seen as priority. I'm sure that we all know about that. Those are number one is Mario Pacific patients, second is age um, three to 35, and which the emphasis of um, four to 19. And lastly is the one that living in the crowded um, circumstances or the lower socioeconomic area. Finally, um, we are having a winter funding initiative for the city has scan following a mild, a minor head injury can be performed in the community as an alternative to attend ED. Um, it is available until the end of September um, this year in Auckland under POAC. So patient with a minor head or facial injury will hit to it have a head CT may be appropriate for a city has scan in the community um, through POAC as an um, alternative um, to being sent to ED. Um, so those are the update that we want to give. I see that um, Daniel was talking about the AI dictation, and I also see that someone was asking about um, dictation with AI. I just want to share that. I'm not expert on that. Um, it's just that I found that a news tools that um, people can use, and maybe people will be interested. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to share the screen now. So I'm just going to do a one minute um, consultation. It's a mock consultation. Don't judge me on my um, patient manner, but I just show you what AI can actually uh, achieve. And this is the website, one of the websites that people can use. So now if we um, start the consultation. Hello, thank you, thank you for coming today. So what's the reason you're coming in today? So you told me they got some cough. Have you been coughing for long? So you are, have been coughing for three days and you also tell me that you got some fever and some runny nose. Okay, you don't have any problems breathing, so that is good as well. Can I just confirm that you don't have any medical problems, no allergies, and you don't take any medication usually? Okay, that's good. So I'm going to examine you now. Next time into your chest, your chest is clear, there's no crepitations, there's no wheeze. You don't have any fever, your oxygen saturation is 99%, and your heart rate is um, good. It's only um, 80 per minute. And you don't look like that you got tonsillitis, there's no pus on your throat. So I think you probably got a bit of a virus um, urges. I think that antibiotics, 
takes is not going to be useful because you've got a viral illness, I suggest you to go home, drink heaps of water, take some rest, heaps of Panadol, some ibuprofen, maybe try some honey for your cough. I think that will be good. And if you look better in three days' time, come back and then we can have a look as well. So this is a mock presentation. These tools will transcript everything that I just speak. Um, they will generate the notes. Um, my my essay is not the best, so sometimes we pick up the wrong thing. But if you look at this here, it's still thinking at the end, then it's actually just create the notes here. So shift complain, cough, fever, when it knows how long did it be coughing for fever, actually not present. So you can change that there when you know not present. And then there's no medical problems, no allergy, no current medications. Saturation is there, low fever. Happy is there, care chest, no tonsillitis and no pus on throat. That's for me because my child is asking and lucky wild illness. No antibiotics prescribed due to the violation of the illness. Patient advised to rest, drink water, take over the contact medications. So Panadol, ibuprofen. Patient advised to try honey for cough relief, follow up in three days if symptoms do not improve. So this is a demonstration. I think I just want to emphasize that um, Daniel, that AI can be useful for us, but we just need to use that as cautious. And at the end, people just need to copy the whole thing. And then they just, just copy that into their PMS. So I just thought I'd share this with everyone. Um, the pilot is called uh, Laba um, Co-Pilot. Um, people can have a look. I think there's a few Facebook um, program that people um, put on the Facebook GP chat and then they have a look as well. So I hope that's useful for everyone. Thank you. We've got some more questions there. Uh, Nabla.com, is that sort of available? Can we just go to that website and um, use it now? Or how yeah, if you can it? go to that website to use it. I think um, you don't need to sign up and you can just share that. Um, and I think you can trial up to 10 patients. And then I think afterwards, there's a monthly fees of up to um, 100 to $200 per month. So, Daniel, maybe just going back to you, any questions here that you answered online um, that might be useful for the group? I learned that there was quite a lot of, there was a flurry of questions, but there's one now that I might just answer live instead of um, typing in, which I think is a really good one, um, from an anonymous attendee around, would the bot decipher the difference between a screening cervical smear versus a diagnostic one? Um, and it's sometimes normal doesn't necessarily mean normal. It's dependent on the clinical context. So I think that's a really good point. And um, what I would say is that um, if you've got a very unique situation where you do need to see the result, then the best thing would be to set a task reminder for that specific scenario. So that if we become accustomed to the bulk of normal cervical smear results being handled in an automated way, for those few results that you actually know that you want to see it, whether it's normal or not, uh, you need to do something different. You need to put a reminder around that. Uh, we've got some uh, similar interesting things around mammograms, where there are some women who um, require more frequent mammograms and they go sometimes uh, through the normal breast screening and sometimes through the outpatient department. And again, it's one of those where um, the bot can certainly pick up the timing uh, and the suggested timing within the letter um, but if you're wanting something different than what it states in the document, then you would need to operate outside of the bot. You would need to set a different screening frequency uh, to follow up on those. And now, there's that question that Richard Selcon had asked about the unregistered GP and the healthcare assistants. Uh, what about nurses and medical legal stuff? Yeah, look, so, so this is only my opinion. Um, I think the original question was around... Um, if you have a retired GP and uh, essentially that they have fully retired and they no longer have an APC, um, can they perform that role that a healthcare assistant might do uh, of uh, going through your inbox? My take on it is that you have to be really, really careful because I think if you uh, ask that retired GP step uh, wrong and you have human error, which can happen to the best of us, um, I think you're quite vulnerable. I think it would easily be litigated that um, you um, have been a GP and as a clinician, you're now operating without having an annual practicing certificate, 
um, and you may not have your MPS or, or indemnity cover. Uh, so I, I personally wouldn't really want someone to be in that situation. Um, my preference if we we're taking on a retired GP would be that they maintain their credentialing uh, and indemnity. Uh, but I would recommend seeking advice before employing people in, in that role. Um, whether that would be the same for nurses, my starting point would be yes. I, I think that um, you can't undo the fact that you uh, have been a registered healthcare professional. And just because you're working within that same framework that unregistered uh, people are working in, when, when something goes wrong, I think it's really hard to hide behind that protocol. Um, whereas an unregistered um, workforce, provided that they are working within that protocol and they're supervised properly, um, I think it'd be a bit different. Yeah, that's just my personal take. Okay, any other the, the questions you answered that would be of interest to the, uh, the wider audience? I was getting a few questions around price, and I think that, um, I, I mean, I can only talk for what we're doing from East Health. So we're, we're not intending to charge clinics. This is something that we see as being uh, just an essential part of what we're doing uh, ongoing. Um, I can't talk for other PHOs. I mean, there is considerable uh, time spent in developing these, so there might be commercial models that are set up. But I, but I think things are moving so fast now that um, I would encourage uh, clinicians to have that conversation with your PHO, just check and say, you know, have they heard about our automation? Are they interested? Um, I'm very happy for other PHOs to reach out to East Health if they want to discuss um, and move that forward. As someone said, if I'm not wanting to invest in a bot, what could I do tomorrow to improve the uh, inbox workload? Uh, I think it's really around utilizing the team uh, that you've got. So it's not given that uh, it should be your most experienced clinicians that should be spending time uh, looking at every single inbox document. Uh, who else have you got that you can train up uh, to bear some of the inbox? Uh, this issue about copying to GP, CCing GPs, a view on that, Daniel? Look, I mean, there's it, no secret that I'm uh, very critical of the culture of copying people into results. I think there's a range of issues. Uh, firstly, um, it pulverizes who's responsible for the result. Um, so I think that anytime you're, you're CCing people in, um, it risks confusion around who actually is responsible. It should always be the requester of a test. Um, I also think that it's a direct uh, risk in terms of um, the total workload for clinicians and risks burnout. So when I talk to GPs that um, are considering either reducing sessions or early retirement, it's often around the volume of admin. Um, so yeah, I, th I think uh, the sooner we can get a grip of uh, grip on the um, copied results, the, the better. Um, are there are there ways we can notify the hospital of a wrong wrong patient? Oh, I answered that one actually. But the main thing, actually, the easiest thing is for if you search on Health Pathways misdirected mail, you will find all the four. Nope, just the three districts. Is Northern in there? Northland may not be there. Northland has their own health pathway, so it's probably somewhere there. I'm sorry, I don't know where it is. But in the, in the Auckland one, you search up misdirected mail and you'll find it. Okay, well, that, that's going to be very useful to know. Maybe um, any final comments? I, I just um, got a good um, comment here from uh, Rakesh Dogra saying that GPs need to read all new dis discharge letters and other results to keep in touch with the patient's clinical developments. Um, so yeah, I, I don't uh, necessarily disagree with that. I, I think that automation bots will handle lots of other things so that um, the clinicians can then focus on the um, transfer of care letters. Uh, but I, I, I would argue that you don't need to see a normal cervical smear result, for instance. I think that if uh, the system can handle that, um, there's no real value in a, in a human uh, casting an eye on it. And I think that you can get better consistency by automating some of the inbox items. Okay, well, I think uh, we've we've hit um, 8.45. So I'd just like to thank our speakers tonight and uh, for acknowledging the, enorm the, uh, the enormous load that is increasing in this digital world. It's rather nice to know that there is some help on the way that the cavalry is coming 
Um, so thank you very much, gentlemen, and um, uh, good night. See you again sometime.